place. Amen. And we are thankful for your presence, as always. And I give honor to my lovely bride of almost 42 years. Amen, as always. And we are going to hear from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we come to you once again thanking you, Lord, for this day. Lord, it is our prayer that you will work in us and through us to make a difference in the world. And Father, we believe that you have placed a seed inside of us, a seed that's going to grow, a seed that is going to be pruned. But most importantly, Lord, you have prepared us and you have uh, commissioned us to be a harvest tool for you. So our prayer today, Lord, is that you will bless us with insight, that you will bless us with knowledge so that we may be the people that you've called us to be, that we may fulfill your commission. And as always, our prayer is that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 So today is the final installment of our Rooted series, the final installment of our Rooted series. And today we're going to talk about harvest, harvest. The harvest is what comes after the planting. The harvest comes after the growing. The harvest comes after the pruning. So we are going to be talking about the harvest and everything necessary to see the fruit of your labor. Amen. Amen. So I want to direct your attention to my beautiful harvest possibility here, my beautiful harvest potential here. Three weeks, three weeks of growth. Hallelujah. It's about ready to be it. <laughs> so we are thankful that God is in the growing business. Amen. Amen. And everybody, everybody wants the delicious fruit, the delicious outcome from the harvest. But not many are willing to do what it takes to do the work that's required. And we want to look at our scripture to kind of dig into that a little deeper. So our scripture we've read earlier today, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And the word reads, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Amen. Amen. Now, there are some biblical scholars that call this passage of scripture a hinge passage. A hinge passage. What is that? Well, a hinge, if you're not familiar, is a swing point between two objects. Amen. A hinge holds together two objects, like a door and the frame of a door. Amen? Amen. So, and this passage that we read this morning holds Jesus' ministry together with our ministry. Yeah. Amen? So it's a hinge passage. Because up until now, it's been all about Jesus' ministry. Jesus has been traveling all throughout Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and teaching in the synagogue. And not only that, not only that, he's been healing the sick and casting out demons. Jesus has calmed the storm. The blind have received their sight. The mute are speaking again. A young girl has been raised from the dead. But something happens right after this. Right after all of this, up until now, it's all been, it's been all about Jesus' ministry in power. But after today's scripture, a shift happens. A shift happens. 
And you only have to look to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, the next verse. Look at what it says. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So what's happening here? What's happening here? We're right at the moment when Jesus makes the switch from preaching and teaching and healing himself to commissioning his disciples to go out and preach and teach and heal. Jesus is about to commission his followers to do what he is doing. And guess what? Guess what, brothers and sisters? We have that same commission Amen. to do what Jesus did. He told us later in the book of Matthew to go ye therefore and make disciples. But in order to do that, in order to do that, Jesus wants us to see people as he sees people. He wants us to see people as they really are. He wants us to be moved in the heart just like he was. It's harvest time and he wants us to be able to see the power of the harvest through his eyes. Amen. And whether we know it or not, we were not saved to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. You were saved with a purpose in mind. Mm -hmm. Not just heaven, not just salvation. All that is great, all that is good. You were saved not to just be changed and conformed to the image of Christ. All that's great, all that's necessary, all that's important. But you were left here on earth because there is work to do. There is the work of reaching people who are lost in sin. Hallelujah. Right. Who are lost and don't even know that they're lost. Right who are miserable and being beaten and broken down by life and by sin and by Satan and by self-righteousness and by self-love. And they need somebody, somebody to come to them and share a message of hope. Not just a hope so message, uh -huh. but a hope that is certain yeah. that will radically change their life for all eternity. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that's our mission. That's our mission, brothers and sisters. That's our job. That's our calling. That's why we are left here. This is why we are sent out into the world. Yeah. It's not enough to gather here in this parking lot on Sunday morning uh -huh. and then just go home and kick back and wait until next week. Uh -huh. We are called to go out into the harvest with the intent and purpose that God has given us. Hallelujah. Amen. God is not interested in you just coming to church right. to the parking lot uh -huh. and rallying around him once a week. He's That's not interested right. in that. That's he wants to be your life. He wants to be your Monday to Saturday yeah. so that when you come here on Sunday that there is true worship, that there is true spirit, and there is some true life in what we do here. Right. Don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake of thinking that God is satisfied just because you show up here in the parking lot. That's right. That's right. He expects more. We're living, brothers and sisters, in yeah. perilous times. Yeah. Perilous times. Yeah. There's virus all around us. Mm. There's division and hatred all around us. Yeah. There's fear and uncertainty all around us. Yeah. There's evil present on every hand. Yes, and there are so many folks who are out there that are lost. Mm. There's been one study by the Barner Institute that estimates that over half the people we come in contact with mm -hmm. are lost. Over half the people we come in contact with don't know Jesus. Amen. And the Bible tells us that God is looking for somebody. Yes. He's looking for some folks. He's looking for some people willing to give their all. Yes. He's looking for some folk who are willing to go from the seats to the streets Amen. sharing the good news right. of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. But in order for us to do that, we've got to be able to see the same thing Jesus saw when he looked at people. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen. And that's what I hope the Holy Spirit impresses on our heart this morning. That we begin to see the same things that Jesus saw when he looked at people. Mm -hmm. So let me give you four things. Four things that Jesus saw. Right. 
Number one, what Jesus saw is the pity of the harvest. The pity of the harvest. We need to see the pity of the harvest. What did he say in verse 36? He says, when he saw the crowds, he says he had compassion on them. Now notice, he saw the crowds. He saw the crowds. He didn't just focus on his disciples or on his inner circle of friends, but he looked out and saw the crowds. He wasn't just concerned about his posse and the folks that he hung around with at church, but he looked out and he saw the crowds. Yes. Crowds of people. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And that word compassion, brothers and sisters, means to be moved inwardly, uh -huh. to yearn, to yearn with tender mercy, uh -huh. with affection, with pity, and with empathy. It refers to the deepest possible feelings. And in the Greek, it means to be moved in the inner organs, the inner organs. It has the same idea as our modern expression when we tell somebody, I love you from the bottom of my heart. All right, now. And when Jesus looked at the lost people, he saw them as they really were. And he saw the pain, and he saw the loneliness, and he saw the emptiness, the misery that they felt in their hearts. And people who were wandering aimlessly through life with no direction, no plan, destination. People who lived their lives with no shepherd for their souls. He saw people who were utterly and hopelessly lost. Yes. And all I'm saying, Olive Branch, is that we need to see crowds like Jesus saw the crowds. Uh -huh. You see, we make the mistake of doing this. We make the mistake of doing this. We look at people, and if somebody has it together financially, we look at the socioeconomic status. And if they really got it going on, we look at them and say, well... I don't need to talk to them about Jesus. They don't have a need for Jesus. I don't know why we think like that. Just because they got all the material success. They got the car. They got the house. They got the clothes. And you name it. We won't talk to them about Jesus. In our minds, they got it all together. And when we go downtown or somewhere and we see the, a homeless person or we see a person on drugs or we see a person who's in a gang and we won't talk to them about Jesus either because we think they probably won't want to hear what we got to say. All right. So we have a dilemma. We have a dilemma. Either we say they're too good or they're too bad. Uh -huh. And either way, we won't talk to anybody That's right. because we don't see them as Jesus sees them. And Jesus sees behind all the dollar signs and all the money that they have in the bank. And he sees the emptiness, the emptiness in their souls. And he sees where they're headed. He sees their destination. And they're headed to hell because they don't know Jesus. Amen. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much you have or how much you have in the bank That's or right. what kind of car you drive. Right. And if you don't know Jesus, uh -huh. you'll be driving that car straight to hell. He sees beyond the gangs That's right. and all the stuff they're involved in. He sees the drugs and so on. And he sees the need for him and he sees the need for salvation. Every day, every opportunity, we ought to be reaching out to folks. We ought to be moved with the same compassion that Jesus had. He saw the crowd. He saw the pity of the crowd. And he saw them weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved to do something about it. Why aren't we more moved when we see people who are lost? Mm. Why is that? For the most part, most of us are comfortable coming to church and getting our praise on. Hallelujah. But we won't take the time during the week to share that with somebody else. All right, now. My, my, my. So we need to see the pity of the harvest that Jesus saw. Yeah. Notice the second thing that Jesus saw. He saw the potential. He saw the pity, and now he sees the potential of the harvest. 
Notice what he says. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful. He said, more than that, he said, the harvest is truly plentiful. Jesus saw the potential. He saw the potential. Now get this, here's what he did. He didn't just focus on the hopelessness of the situation, mm -hmm. but he focused on the hope in the situation. Right. Jesus didn't have pity and do nothing, but he said, folks, get out your sickle and let's harvest them. Right. Jesus didn't see them as always being in that situation, uh -huh. but he saw them being transformed into a different spirit. He saw lost folks being saved. Yeah. He saw sinners becoming saints. Yeah. He saw guilty folks being set free. Yeah. He saw the unforgiven being forgiven. He saw those deserving hell getting grace. And instead of moaning and groaning about the bad state of affairs, he magnified the expectancy and hopefulness that comes with the harvest. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Do you see those around you as potential saints? <laughs> Do you see family members as potential saints? Do you see your nosy and crabby neighbors as potential saints? Do you see your racist boss and your backstabbing coworkers as potential saints? Oh, we see all the things going wrong and we think things are getting worse and worse so, so much that we never see the potential in the world. We don't see the potential in the world. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Where there is a lost soul and where there is the grace of God, there is hope. And there is a potential saint. Amen. Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad somebody saw the potential in me. Even when I was out there acting out my name, Wilder. Somebody saw the potential in me. Even when I wanted nothing to do with God or the church or anything good and holy and righteous, I wanted nothing to do with it. But somebody saw the potential in me. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind took the time and prayed for me. Yeah. And I'm so glad they prayed. Yeah. I'm so glad they prayed yeah. for me. Somebody saw the potential. And that's what I want us to do as a church. See the potential of the harvest. You come in contact with some folks every day that are potential saints. I don't care what kind of language they use. I don't care what they've been doing. See them potentially in Christ. So he saw the potential of the harvest. But the third thing he saw was the problem of the harvest. The problem of the harvest. He said in verse 37 that the harvest is plentiful and here's the problem. But the workers, the laborers are few. So brothers and sisters, the problem of the lack of harvest is not in the harvest itself. Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful. Amen? Amen. The harvest is plentiful. The problem of the lack of harvest is not in God because we serve a God that still saves. Amen? Amen. We serve a God who still pours out his grace and his mercy. Yeah. Amen. He says the problem is the workers, the laborers are few. The problem is not many are interested and involved in gathering the harvest. Because now you got to do more than just come to church. That's right. All right. That's right. Now you got to roll up your sleeves. Right. Now you got to sweat a little bit. Right. Now you got to get a little dirty. And not many are willing to do that. Right. Those of you who know farming know that the harvest doesn't just gather itself. Amen. Amen. You got to go out there in the field and get it. Amen. Amen. You got to get down to where it is. You got to do the dirty work of harvesting it. And wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if the beans, the squash, the tomatoes, and the corn just harvested themselves, That's right. just plucked themselves, and ended up on your doorstep? Right. Well, it doesn't work like that. 
to harvest your garden, you have to go to where the harvest is. Amen? Amen. The harvest doesn't come on its own. It must be reaped. And therein lies the problem. If you want to bring folks to Jesus, if you want to bring folks to Jesus, you have to go where they are. You got to meet them where they are. We can sit in the church, but we won't see a harvest until we reach outside of the property lines of Olive Branch Baptist Church. Amen. Where the lost are living. Amen. I think that's a problem in some of our lives. We're too wrapped up in ourselves. We're wrapped up in our lives. We're wrapped up in our families and all the stuff we got going on. Too wrapped up to be concerned about anybody else who's not saved. Right. Amen. Amen. Mm. Amen. Are you concerned? Are you concerned about what we're here about? Let me say that again. Right. Are you concerned about what we are here about? Or are we happy? Are we happy just to come here and sit on our blessed assurance? Mm. <laughs> come on. All right, now. Go ahead. Have mercy. Have mercy. The fourth thing that Jesus saw, he saw the power in the harvest. He saw the power of the harvest. And this is what he said in verse 38. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus says, pray. The first thing we need to do is pray. Why? Why? Because this is the Lord's work. And what's impossible with men is possible with God. And if there's going to be a great reaping of the harvest, it's going to be because of God. Amen? Amen. The harvest that we want is impossible with us. We can plant and we can water, but only God can cause things to grow. Amen. The new birth, the new birth that we have in Christ is nothing but a miracle. It's based on God's power. Only he can heal the lame. Yes. Only he can raise the dead. Yes. Only he can heal sickness. Yes. Only he can cause ears to hear. Yes. Only he can cause dead tongues to speak. It's, it's in his power, but we have to tap into that power. That's right. And here's the other thing that I notice about this. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. You see, I believe through prayer... We'll gain the compassion that we need. I believe through prayer, we'll see uh, the harvest as it truly is. We'll see that there's great potential in the harvest. And through prayer, we'll ask the Lord to send people for the harvest, workers into his harvest field. But here's the deal. Here's the deal, brothers and sisters. How can I ask God to send out workers into his harvest field if I don't first say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I am the answer to my own prayer. Are you feeling me? I am the answer to my own prayer. So when I get on my knees and I say, Lord, send more workers, the first worker is going to be me. When I get up off my knees, I realize that I am he. Yes. I am it. I am the answer. Just as they prayed for more workers, God was sending them out. And the ones who did the praying, that's who God sent out. Right, but not only that, Jesus says pray because while you are on your knees, while you are on your knees seeking a change in those who are lost, God will be changing you. God will be changing you so that you, he can use you to change those who are lost. Hallelujah. So we need to pray. We need to pray for the harvest. And we need to be the answer to that prayer. It's harvest time. That's why we're praying that God will push. God will push somebody out of their comfort zone today. Pray that God will push you out of your comfort zone. When God pushes you, when God pushes you, you can't resist. You can't hold back. When God pushes you, when God pushes you, miraculous things can happen. What's impossible for man, God makes possible. And when God pushes you, you can be like the believers in the book of Acts. 
The Bible says that there were 120 believers right. along with the disciples in the upper room. And overnight, 120 believers became 3,000 believers. Right. It's God that multiplies. Yeah. It's God that increases. Yeah. It's God that magnifies. Yeah. It's harvest time. Yeah. It's harvest time. Yeah. When God pushes you, yeah. you'll be just like Noah. Yeah. You may have been out there doing your own thing in your own way, but God pushes you. Now you find yourself going out to tell somebody it's going to rain. All the people may look at you funny. The people may think you're crazy. The people may think you're out of your ever-loving mind. But God, but God, but God will use you. You'll find yourself being used just like Noah. Noah was out there for 120 years talking about it's going to rain. But when God pushes you, you'll see yourself out there every day, each and every day, telling anybody, telling everybody about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me. It's harvest time. When God pushes you, when people are praying, and God pushes you, you'll find yourself just like Jonah. Just like Jonah. Jonah found, Jonah found himself trying to run from God. He ran down into the belly of the ship. He ran down into the belly of a great fish. Down into the belly of the sea. But when God has something for you to do, the Bible says at the right time, in the opportune time, at the appointed time, just like Jonah, he'll spit you out on dry land and he'll still use you. When God has something for you to do, you might run, but you can't hide. He will find you. When you do the praying and God does the pushing, God will empower you for the harvest and he will do the saving. It's harvest time. You've been planted. You've been planted. You have grown. You've been pruned. Now it's time for the harvest. Now it's time to go to work. You need to do what you can, while you can, and leave the results to God, knowing that your labor is not in vain. There's joy in the harvest. There's love in the harvest. There's power in the harvest. And Jesus is waiting for you in the harvest. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. Get ready. Roll up your sleeves. Get ready to go to work because Jesus has need of you. May the Lord bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's harvest time. Time to go to work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This ain't no joke, y'all. That's right. We're not here for nothing. That's right. We're not here just to show up. Mm. There's work for us to do. Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah. is the opportune time. That's right. People are looking for answers. People are running scared. Yes. And they look to us, mm. the Christians, uh -huh. for answers. Yeah. Mm. We have, even in a pandemic, even with social distancing, we can still have an impact for the cause of Christ. That's right. The gospel has not stopped. That's right. The word and the power of the gospel goes forth. Hell whether you're standing six feet apart or standing right next to each other. We have ways to still connect with people. We still have telephones. That's right. We can still holler across the fence at our neighbors. Yes. Some of us are still going to work. We interact with people at work. It's harvest time, y'all. It's harvest time. Ask somebody, can I, pray, can I pray something for you? Open the door. Ask them to come to the parking lot next week. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Send them the link to a sermon. Anything. Mm -hmm. But we got to do something. We got to do what we can, when we can, while we can. That's right. Because the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. There's plenty out there. Plenty of folks out there looking, 
for answers. That's right. And we can be that answer for them. Yeah. We may be the only Bible that they see. Yeah. So we need to live right and do the things that the Lord has called us to do. That's right. To go ye therefore. Yeah. It's a command. It's a commission. We need to be making disciples. So we praise God for his word. We praise God for all of you. And at this time, we're going to we're going to pray, and we're going to close out for today. It's hot today. It's going to be a hot one today. But as Lady Barbara said, if you think this is hot, that's right. Think about hell. This ain't nothing compared to how hell is described. The lake of fire. Hallelujah. Nobody wants anyone to go there. So we're going to pray at this time. Let's bow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this series, Lord, that has blessed our souls. Being rooted. Ultimately, Father God, we want to be rooted in you. We need to be planted by you. We need to prepare our soil to be used by you for the planting. We need to grow in you. We can't stay the same as we were when we first got saved. And Father, we need to be pruned from time to time. If there are things in our life that are not pleasing to you or things that are hindering our relationship with you, cut it off, Lord. Snip it, Father God. Take it away, Lord, so that we may serve you and serve you in spirit and in truth. And finally, Father God, we want to be prepared We are prepared, but we want to be your harvest instrument, Lord. Lord, there are so many needs out there, so many needs, so many people that are lost and don't even know that they're lost. And we see them every day. Over half the people, Father God, that we come in contact with are lost, are on their way to hell. So surely, Father God, surely we can make a difference. Empower us, Lord. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Give us the strength. Give us the words to say. Give us the unction to go forth and do your will. Give us the ability, Father God, to be effective witnesses for you in this sin-sick world. Father, we're just so grateful that you have shown us the way. All we have to do is follow Jesus' lead. All we have to do is be like Jesus. He preached, he teached, and he healed. We can do the same thing, Lord. We can preach, we can teach, and we can heal. And the best healing is helping to heal someone from sin, Father God. So we pray, Lord, that you would just empower us with your spirit to be bold for you, to be fierce for you. Have your way, Lord, in our lives each and every day. Have your way, Lord, so that we may go forth and proclaim the goodness of your son, Jesus. So we pray in the name of Jesus that you continue to guide us, continue to teach us, continue to direct our paths and our words so that we may be effective for your kingdom. We may be instruments in the uplifting of your kingdom. Use us, Father God, we pray. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you, Lord, for this branch of Zion, the Allah Branch Baptist Church family. What a wonderful family we are, Lord. So, Lord, we ask your blessings on us, strengthen us, fortify us, bind our hearts together as one, Lord, focused on you, because ultimately it's all about you, Lord. So we leave it at your feet, Father God. We trust you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We magnify you. We adore you, Lord. And we know you love us. So we ask now as we leave this place, we pray, Lord, that we leave this place changed. We pray, Lord, that we leave this place with a desire to do more for you, for the upbuilding for your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord, someone somewhere will respond to the planting that we do. Someone somewhere will respond to the watering that we do. And, Father, we'll leave the increase, we'll leave the growing to you. All we have to do is do what you've asked us to do and leave the rest to you. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you. We honor you. Be with us on this day and every day throughout this week. Help us to 
Let this word marinate in our spirits, Lord, yes. so that we may be the instruments that you've called us to be. Yes. Have your way, Lord. Mm -hmm. Have your way. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. In Jesus name. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling mm -hmm. and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now, henceforth, and forevermore. And all of God's people honk their horns with an amen. amen.